Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Transatlantic Poetry Reading. Uh, I'm Tim Green, editor of Rattle. Um, we have two wonderful poetry readings today from recent issues. Um, D.M. Adeira Bibe is um, a poet from um, the last winter's issue. And uh, we also have Zaina Hashem Beck, who is a poet who's appeared in um, our Poetry Spawn News Poem series twice uh, over the last couple of years. And she's also the winner of the um, 2016 Rattle Chaplet Prize. So we're really excited to have both these poets. Um, why don't you guys come on in and say hi to everybody in the world? Uh, first is uh, DM Adeira Baby. Uh, he's in Boston right now, but from Nigeria. DM, can you come on up and say hi? Hey, hello, hello everyone. How's it going? <laughs> okay, so um, <clears throat> I'm kind of like, um, I'm happy to be here, you know, and to share some, some of my poems, you know, yeah. So and and uh, yeah, and we also have Zaina Hashim Beck, who's uh, coming from um, Dubai today. Say hi, Zaina. Hi. It's hot <laughs> in here in Dubai. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Robert, for putting this together. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to have uh, each of these two poets are going to read for about 20 minutes apiece, and then we're going to have some question and answers. If anybody has any questions for either of them, you can um, tweet it to TA Poetry, or you can use the comment that's included um, with this Google Hangouts. Um, so get your questions ready, and, and the two questions that generate the best discussions, they'll get a free copy of Rattle. You can have a copy of the one that uh, DM is in, and you can also have a copy of the one coming out uh, with Zane's chapbook in the fall. Um, so here he is. So what we have are two really electric emerging poets. Um, they both won big chapbook prizes. I mentioned Zaina won our Rattle uh, chapbook prize, but um, DM Adira Baby um, won the, um, oh, what's it called? The APBF New Generation African Poets chapbook series selected by Kwame Dawes and Chris Avani. Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing more of his work. And um, his poem from Rattle is um, The Origin of Kindness, which led off issue number 50. Um, so here he is, uh, DM Adira Bibe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, hello once again, everyone. So I'm going to begin this reading um, by reading it from a couple of new poems. Um, so... Yeah, um, I've kind of like been working on this um, new collection of poems. Okay, you, uh, I'm, I've kind of like been working on this co um, new collection of poems, like a series sort of, in which I try to, um, you know, write on what it means to be to be young in, you know, Nigeria in particular, and. Africa in general, you know, I, I, I feel like I, I feel like there are, you know, so many things that are not known about, you know, the continents. So many positive things actually that are not known about the continent and I try to, you know, just propagate that. So as you were seeing a couple of the points a couple of these points now. Um so yeah. Um the first poem is titled Antiros in the Evening. Antiros is a Greek god of requited love when you love someone and they love you back. So yes, I'll begin. Ants in ants, mouth in mouth, we drown on our way to the river. At the bank, leaves clothed with autumn scuttle about, like running with nowhere in mind, like living without loving. Breeze begins to bury us. Two bodies turn one. My heart talks. I crave the goddess you are becoming. Um, so yeah, so that's that's a love poem and um, this is th this is also a love poem and um, th th this poem is also in similar vein. So it's kind of like the first poem I read, you know, they are kind of like in the same um, you know, in the same lineage here. This is titled Love Song. Sometimes when music
files out of the radio. My eyes prepare to give birth. Such was that noon. The warm sky filled with love songs. We were 16 and didn't know who Cupid was. But you had your teeth on my right hair lobe, causing me pain I still test for. Your hands on my chest, measuring how unreasonable life could be when in love. I put my head on your shoulder to feel this love song filing out of a radio made of teeth and tongue. Yeah, um, so with that, I want to move to a different, um, you know, a different team, sort of, but still kind of like still in the same series. Um, these, I'll read two poems now. These two poems are kind of like, um, these two poems are bound by um, location, you know, rather than, you know, teams. And they're kind of like still, will still be, hopefully will be in the same collection as the two love poems I just read because they are all, you know, set in, you know, in a high school in Nigeria, in a boarding school in Nigeria, you know, so, yeah. So, yeah, this, this is titled Discovery. So this poem actually, um, this poem arose as a result of, you know, as a result of me trying to just understand, you know, after losing my mom, just trying to understand, you know, trying to understand the source of sadness, you know, for some reason. I, I, I still haven't found it anyways. I still haven't found an answer to that, but, you know, this poem is just an attempt, you know, to understand that. So this is titled Discovery. Long time ago, the school principals sent us out like caged pets and locked down the dormitory so we could see how an elegy was sung. Men in black suits, shirts and pants, blue and blue trumpets over a casket while we witnessed the sound tear through the hall, a commotion. Next morning, assembly ground, we talked about our joy from the sorrows of the previous day. The principal cried from the sorrows of our joy. Silence, silence, silence. Right then, I knew there was no dictator like sadness. And um, the last point from this series, um, it, um, the last point from this series is kind of like, um, it's also, you know, the, the last point from this series is an attempt to use love as a vehicle. So this poem uses love as a means to an end. The poem is actually kind of like, you know, heading somewhere. It's a teleologic poem. You know, it's talking about, in essence, it's kind of like exploring sorrow as well, but just using love, you know, as a vehicle to arrive at that, you know, main, at that um, particular point. So this is titled, There Was Death Anyway. Let's continue in the dining hall during dinner. The lady I loved would not respond to my screaming hearts. Oreke lewa mi, aya mi atata. The only in my tea, she would not respond. Let's begin in a fine art class in the morning. The lady I loved asked if she was as beautiful as Da Vinci's Mona Lisa. I was silent. This silence erupted into the greatest war I ever fought. I was silent because each time I learned what beauty meant, a goddess died. So I read a couple of poems from my recently published chat book. Um, so the one team just talked about that was selected by Kwame Dawes and Chris Abani for the APBF New Generation African Poet Chat Book Series. So it's still, it, it's just, it's it, it was actually published about two weeks ago. So there are still copies up for grab. So yeah, um, 
Yeah, so yeah, the first poem I'll be reading from here is titled Olumos Face. So um, the poems in this book basically revolve around um, absence and domestic violence, dom domestic violence here, yeah, and um, abuse in general, you know, because I believe some kind of like you know abuse can be active or passive but irrespective of what is abuse is an abuse is an abuse you know so the, the these points try to kind of like investigate and try to you know try to bring to the fore um, issues of domestic um, abuse that are kind of like really really overlooked unfortunately overlooked by you know many writers from my continent, you know, well, and I don't blame them for that because there are other teams to write about, but for me, because I, you know, grew up in, you know, because I grew up in a, you know, in this situation where I watch my mom get beat down, I watch other women get beat down, so I kind of like, I find myself returning to this team every time, you know, so this is tied to the Olumo space. Olumo is a rock, it's, it's an important rock in Nigeria and it's based in, um, Olumo rock is found in um, Abel Kuta, which is a city in Nigeria, and a doctor also appears in this point, so don't be surprised when you see that. Olumo's face, walking across a bamboo bridge, spread on a marsh, which tore Abe Okuta into two halves, a hole clipped to a shoulder, a peg to a cloth on a line. Shadows of Olumo rock, fluttering beneath the limbs of insects perched on the face of the unholy water. The hair stopped moving, but the water fluttered. My grandmother's eyes walked on the water. On the end of the bridge, a man pressed a woman's head into the water because of her dead womb. When did a woman's failure lift her to the throne of God or the seat of Darwin to give reasons for life? The man pressed and pressed the woman's face into the water. My grandmother, just nine, cried and cried before the woman became a ghost. So um, the next poem I'll read from this book. Is titled Elegy for My Mother. So here it's kind of like an elegy, just kind of like celebrating, um, kind of like it's not even celebrating, you know, it's just this poem is just trying to um, kind of like trying to, the, the poem is trying to talk about what it means, you know, to be a woman, you know, because honestly speaking, you know, women kind of like the they go through stress to give birth. Like, you know, what, like the stress they go through to give birth is way, way, can be compared because a man doesn't get pregnant, a man, you know, doesn't give birth, doesn't go through anything. So for a woman, you know, to give birth and then lose that child, I, I just imagine what it feels like. Because for me, you know, I'm not a woman, I, so I've never felt what it, what it can be like to be a woman, you know, but so I just try to imagine what it could mean, you know, to lose, you know, your, your child that you gave birth that you had you, you know that you had in your tummy for nine months and all that so this is titled elegy for my mothers let's not pretend the sky is always plated with beauty even the gods are not too perfect on my grandmother's skin the heaven doesn't stop crying for 13 years God's eyes are parched with red. A schoolboy's body, a only son, empty like a soda can, found at the doorway of his mother's store. All the women in his life gather around what the police's anger has left of him, each calling his name as though death is a disease noise could cure. Each calls his name, their breasts flapping like clothes on a line driven by wind. Lord, is this what it takes to be a woman? So 
I read two short, two more poems that are very short, and yeah, and then we can round up, and then we will move on to you know, and then I'll close my reading. So yeah, so this is titled "My Mother Remakes That Morning." So this poem is also like I said earlier, the book, the poems in this book revolve around you know, abuse, you know, violent abuse and non-violent abuse, you know, whichever way we see it, but you know, so this this is just the poem itself is kind of like graphic like you see you know when I read it so I won't say much about this poem. This poem is titled My Mother Remakes That Morning. My older sister dragged me out of a dream. We placed our ears on the wall. My father on the phone saying I love you to another woman. My mother heard. She talked. My father tightened his fist. My mother's face, rough with injuries. My mother rested her head on my aunt's arm. She talked and talked, remaking the morning with her tongue, like God. So yeah, the, the, so I will just um, close the reading with an elegy. You know, um, so yeah, I wrote a couple of elegies, you know, after I lost my mom, you know, and then I was kind of like really grieving. And then I, you know, but, you know, given the fact that I know that pain is universal, grief is universal, you know, we are, we are all, you know, we, we all breathe and we have feelings. So irrespective of, you know, where we are, irrespective of who we grieve for, you know, if you grieve, if you grieve for your friend, if you grieve for your mother, if you grieve for your father, or your child, you know, grief is grief. So, you know, that's why, you know, when I write this poem that kind of like comes out from my, you know, personal experience, I just want to believe that I'm not alone, you know. Somebody, you know, also feels that way and will relate to, you know, some of these poems. Yeah, so this is titled Mother Again. So, yeah, Mother Again. The bus drives me into nostalgia. The window, the clouds gathering around the sky. Evening dies slowly. Lagos lost in dusk which frame. The bus parks halogen lamps lighting the night. At the junction where you buried me inside your mouth, mother, I sell my body for a vase of flowers, for a bottle of nail polish. I ply the road to the deteriorating wall of your grave, where I inscribe the depths I hold you with a brush drenched with nail polish. I set the vase upon your concrete breast. So yeah, um, so thank you. And um yeah. So yeah. Over to oh, thanks, oh, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, that was DM Dave Uh thanks so much, DM. Uh, beautiful poetry. Um and next up we're gonna go back to Dubai with Zaina Hashembeck. Um Zaina is a Lebanese poet. Um she lives in Dubai now. Uh, her first book, To Live in Autumn, won the um, Backwaters Press. Um, Backwater Prize in 2013, selected by Lola Haskins, and um, her book, Therabi Song, I don't know if I'm saying that right, I'm interested to see how you pronounce that, um, uh, but, but that won the uh, Rattle Chapbook Prize just now, um, so we're really excited to hear more of that. And here she is, Zaina Hashenbeck. I think you're on mute still, Zaina. Yeah, unmute. Yeah. Hi. Unmute. Hi. There it's you called, go. It's called the Arabi song. I knew I knew people who who are not Arab would struggle with that. That's part of why I I like this chapbook, Ah Arabi song. Uh, thank you, DM. That was beautiful. You should have like flaunted your new chapbook. You should have showed it to us. Congratulations. It's only um, uh, what you said uh, two two weeks old. Wow. All right, I am going to uh, begin with a poem from uh, Arabi song, which is which means Arabic song, uh, which 
which is the chapbook that just won the Rattle Prize. And this particular poem is about uh, losing my uh, cousin to a shooting on the street in my hometown of Tripoli, Lebanon, a couple of years ago. It's called Dismantling Grief. Dismantling grief is never a straightforward thing. Start with a handful of earth scattered over the wrapped body lowered into the ground. Move back to when you were tying your shoelaces before the phone rang. The hello, the silence. Are we all martyrs, writes Darwish. Months after the burial, he will come back to ask about the bullets, the holes in his chest. Tell him you are eating falafel on the street. Try to stay still until almost nothing is left but the sound of water inside the building walls. The beauty of sunsets will hurt, fade the red. Like a matchstick, you will break burn. Go back to the afternoon when you were both ten learning how to make a circle. Remember how he taught you to steady your hand. Go out on the balcony. Sip your morning coffee in the cold look. The paper on the parked car says for sale. And Julia is singing Bid'ilak. I pray for you. This is a good day to run. Your shoes are in the closet. Get them. So um, I will move on to uh, a sort of lighter uh, love poem, also from the chapbook. Um, so the chapbook is called the Arabi Song, and I, um, I. It's a tribute to many things. One of the things that I'm paying tribute uh, for or to is actual Arab singers that, that I sort of grew up listening to. This particular poem is a love poem. It's called Fiyom Wilela, which means it's, it's, a, it's a title of an Arabic song by an Algerian, uh, famous Algerian Arab singer called Werda. And uh, Fiyom Wilela means in a day and a night. And I guess this is a love poem uh, that's about trying not to talk politics for a day and a night. Spare me this Arab love for dictators tonight. Come closer. Listen. Warda is singing. This day, this night. Let us push this talk of the land to the side. Spare me this Arab love for conspiracy tonight. Lower your voice to the sound of my pupils. Look at me. Let's music instead. Let's cigarette. Let's wine and laughter. Let's call friends. Remember how our mothers used to serve cigarette packs on trays to their guests? Fi Malboro, Fi Viceroy, Fi Gitan, they said. Every house had them cigarette trays. Some nights the politics settled with the ashes and the jokes came, the clapping, the Allah, Allah rising with the smoke, the dancing. Time tortures everyone. Let's heal a little. Ask me if I could ever love again. Let's exaggerate. Ask me if there, are, there will ever be arms like mine. Warda is singing, she'd been missing you long before she'd met you. I missed you before I'd met you too. And now, Habibi, even more. Even more. Okay, I am going to... Um, go back to the book, my first book, To Live in Autumn, um, is a book uh, that won the Backwaters Prize. 
And it's not about autumn, it's about the city of Beirut, but also branches into other Arab cities. I'm going to read the last poem in the book, the very last poem in To Live in Autumn is called Spring. And uh, I imagine it as a series of phone call conversations between friends sort of talking about the Arab Spring. And it begins with a quote by Adrienne Rich, and she goes, there are poverties and there are poverties. And I think I've memorized it. If I mess up, I'll just go back to the book. So this is Spring. I hear your neighbor has trouble sleeping trouble eating, that she changes her door locks every week and has brought all her plants indoors, hid her Bible under the mattress. Though the streets are not safe, you say, you still go out every night to forget. Or is it to remember? Am I exaggerating? I hear Hamra is not the same anymore. Syrian refugees on the streets, men begging, children selling roses, selling roses. Why are the doomed always selling roses? I hear these borders have been failing, have failed, will fail. These fake borders will shift like continents. I wonder who is holding the big crayons this time and what color will our share of sky be to which God will it be forced to answer. There is exile, my friend, and there is exile. My husband, he keeps telling me the Salafis are coming. The Salafis are coming, says we should sell the house and buy one here in this exile, this desert, because home is no longer the home we knew when we were young. And I shout, I laugh, I break something, tell him home was never the one we wanted the one we imagined, the one we knew when we were young and didn't listen to the evening news, I tell him I believe. I still believe. I repeat myself like that broken CD of ours that got stuck on will always, will always. But he, he has burned holy books, newspapers, manifestos a long time ago like one who is lost in the woods and wants to scare away the wolves. He wakes me up in the middle of the night, tells me to look, listen to that Palestinian guy from Gaza. He's the new Arab idol. He used to sing at weddings, never got paid, climbed walls, crossed borders, smuggled his dream just to feed a little prayer into this microphone. There is religion, my friend, and there's religion. You say the theaters are still open. And I see red wooden doors and people eager to watch that play enacted by the inmates of that horrible prison and that play by the patients in the psychiatric ward and that play about a woman who wakes her husband in the early morning to tell him she might have stopped knowing how to trace the aroma of her coffee back to their occupied house. I hear we are still running marathons and exhaling shisha smoke. I hear we are still diving in this polluted sea, diving in this polluted sky, looking for our black hearts like precious pearls, singing songs that are either about love or our country, and better still, about love and our country. For we want them both, we do, to take us into their mud, their pain, there is longing, my friend, and there is longing. I hear the shooting is heavier in Tripoli this Friday. That people are afraid of prayer day now. They are afraid of prayer. Will the sound of the Adhan never be pure to my ears again? Listen. The shooting is heavier in Tripoli this Friday, so don't take that roundabout. You know the one with the word Allah painted green? It's probably blocked. All motorcycles and black smoke, tires burning, people cursing around it in the name of this stone god erected in its middle. I gulped tequila shots and danced until dawn, until the phone rang and I was told my daughter was feverish. No Panadol would do and I knew it was another kind of fever, the kind that children who long for their mothers burn with, the kind that the exiled longing for their houses burn with, the kind that could fill mountains with hate. These mountains 
They never wanted anything but a little sun, a little air, a little grass. There's guilt, my friend, and there's guilt. I hear your friend in Damascus who has three kids, hasn't left, crosses herself many times a day, convinces herself life is fine, life is fine and she doesn't care who wins, really she just wants her boys to play football on the street again. I tell you, see, Egypt hasn't given up. I knew it, would it not? Egypt, no. And of course, I exaggerate. But who cares? Now that we have a second revolution, we do. Right? You say the word revolution also means turning around something else. So I ask you about that tree with the beautiful leaves across the street. Is it still there? Does the wind still release the song of the sea from its branches? You say it's strange that I only seem to remember it in spring. You remind me that the leaves you listen to every year are different leaves that have replaced the fallen ones, that they have no memory of you and me on this street. Perhaps it's better to look for ourselves in the brown ones rustling on the floor. You say we might be on the verge, on the verge of another civil war. And what on earth do we do if it comes? How long can one pretend to exist outside of this when blood might flood the streets instead of rain? What flowers will grow then? And where will we bury our dead? There is spring, my friend, and there is spring. So that was the last poem in my book, which is always heavy to read. So I want to sort of lift the mood up and sort of answer the question uh, that I asked in that poem, will the sound of the Adhan never be pure to my ears again? Listen. I will read, uh, I will go back to the Bratul Chab book, Arabi song, and read a poem called Adhan. Adhan means the Muslim call to prayer. And I grew up in a city, Tripoli, Lebanon, where we just heard the Adhan flood, literally flood the entire city five times a day. And it was just beautiful to listen to these beautiful voices. Uh, no matter what religion you are or what you believe, it was just a beautiful experience. And of course, the Adhan says, Allahu Akbar, which means God is great. And I've been thinking about these words, Allahu Akbar, and how they are being used right now to sort of generate fear. I mean, I am almost even afraid of them now, even to me now. The words, Allahu Akbar, that I grew up with and heard five times a day in my hometown almost mean ISIS now, and I wanted to fight that. And uh, a, little, a little piece of information for that particular tome, uh, poem. The Adhan at dawn has one line that the other uh, calls to prayer don't. The Adhan at dawn says, As-salatu khayrun min al nawm which means prayer is better than sleep. And so the Sheikh is trying to guilt you into getting out of bed and praying, <laughs> of course. And um, so I've been thinking about that too. What does it mean? Prayer is better than sleep in a metaphorical sense, not in a religious sense, not to be asleep and to be awake and to pray and to notice. I think poetry is a kind of prayer, certainly. So this is a non-religious poem about the Adhan called Adhan. There is something about the Adhan at dawn, how it lifts your head from your pillow, how it pulls you from sleep like a bucket from a dark well, heavy with the same wish to fall. How when the sky is still full of shadows, it calls that prayer is better than sleep. And there's something Shakespearean about it. And something modern, how the voices rise now from different speakers in different mosques. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, an unsynchronized Greek chorus that glazes the city, reaches the gutters, the babies in their cots, the thieves, repeats prayer is better than sleep, as if 
The world is beautiful and full of sunrises. Prayer is better than sleep, so you grip your lover's arm, the book on your bedside table, your cigarette pack, your blanket, as if, yes, I heard you. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, two more poems. Um, I thought that I would sort of um, drift away a little bit from the political poems and read a poem for my uh, daughter. Uh, my young daughter was born premature, stayed in the inc incubator for quite a while and gave us a scare. She's six now and she's doing really well. Uh, this is a poem about that and it's called Milk. I couldn't give you my uterus for more than eight months, so I wanted to make sure I could at least give you milk. Only one breast swelled and filled, so my friend said, let it be, let it go, but I timed myself, pumped milk every four hours, even at night, as if you were there waking me, as if you weren't in a hospital incubator. The noise of the pump shattered the night silence, its rhythm like a heartbeat clenching, releasing. I placed the liquid in freezer bags, wrote dates on them. The nurses were shocked that so much milk could come out of one breast. I thought it was darker than I expected and denser. When we brought you home, swaddled and tiny, my family finally dared to laugh at me, walking around with one breast bigger than the other. I told them I liked the fullness of it and that love was always asymmetrical. So that's like a motherhood poem. I'm going to end with Another motherhood poem from uh, my book, from To Live in Autumn. This time it's a poem from my mom who uh, was French educated, dropped out of school when she was 15 to marry my dad. And so all the English that she knows, she taught herself. And a couple, of, a couple of years ago, she's in her 50s, she took this university course for seniors that didn't require that you have any degree. So that was, there was this American uh, teacher giving this uh, course to seniors and so she took it and it was in English and it was a creative writing class and she had to write an essay every week and she sent me the essay to correct every week which I did not like to do but kind of had to do it because she's my mom right so this is sort of about that and it is called correcting my mother's essay my mom started writing essays she started writing essays in English, essays with wrong punctuation, wrong verb tenses, wrong spacing, wrong spelling, with Arabic terms too, typed in English and a French accent, when she couldn't find the translation for, say, Mina. She emails me. She tells me she's very uh, exited about this. Her American teacher loves her ideas, even in her bad English. Take a look, she says. Oh, no, I think. Their topic this week is now and then, as in something that happened now and reminded you of then. The teachers prompted them two words, Boston Marathon, asked what it reminded them of. My mom begins her essay by imagining the people who was about to marathon. How sad. How sad it is to be about to be running to your dying. Maybe they buy a new shoes yesterday, she writes. Maybe they buy a new shoes for the marathon. How sad she knows. She knows what it feels like after you hear an explode and run to the phone to check on your mother, your brother, your wife. Bad memories, they sleep, she writes. But all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they awake. 
She remembers it now, that Friday, how she walked to the pediatrician, swinging me, three months old, from a basket in her hand, my brother, five, walking beside her. She remembers his navy blue clothes, his smile, and how the wind was taking his blonde hair straight aback. She remembers the suddenly explodes, the suddenly explodes, people running, cursing this country. She remembers hiding him in her jacket. I couldn't breath, she writes. I couldn't breath. She remembers asking God to send all his angles, all his angles to help her reach the building. She remembers reaching the building in what felt like a worst century, finishing her own. Marathon. She remembers watching her children sleep that night, the night sky, red, intense explosions. She remembers broken homes in her broken English. My hurt breaks today too, she writes. No matter where the killing is, my hurt breaks too. She types it all in this broken English that I dare not correct. Nothing is wrong with your broken English mom. Nothing is wrong with your thanks God or the way you misspell fever and country, the way you write main gate instead of door. No, nothing is wrong, mama. Mashi, with the way you write Allah in Ajina instead of God, save us. You do not need to translate for we get it, mama. We get it in every broken language with every broken heart. So, Tim, that was my reading. You can come back to the... Well, thanks so much, Sina. That was just wonderful. Um, let's see, do we have any... Do we have any questions? If you have any questions, um, just go ahead and ask us, and we can talk to uh, Zaina and DM. Um, hey, DM, are you still there? Um. Hey, why don't you come back on? We'll have a little discussion just about um, about yeah. poetry and, and yeah, whatnot. Yeah, um, you know, I was wondering what what drew you to poetry in the first place. Okay, like, why um, poetry and not and not other other forms of writing? Um, well, I funny enough, funny enough, I started out as an essayist. You know, I started out writing essays and you know other forms before you know. Before entering poetry full time, um, but I, I just think I've kind of a, I've always been a poet. I just didn't know, you know, <laughs> yeah, because I've kind of I've always read I've always read poetry, you know, I've always read books of poems and all that, but I just never wrote it until you know until my late teens, until I was nineteen, I think, yeah. So yeah, that's. That's that's what I can. That's the easiest um, response to that, you know. But in another way, I I, I just think I, I really find poetry attractive, you know. I and I find it. I kind of I see poetry as a way of you know really, really you know saying what you want to say without not letting everyone know, you know. Like I write a lot about. I write a lot about family issues and I write some autobiographical poems, you know. And in most of my poems, I, I malign my dad a lot, you know. So my daddy does, my father, for instance, doesn't understand poetry, so he doesn't know I'm kind of malignant him, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if I wrote it in fiction or in essay, it's so easy, you know, in other forms. So yeah, so you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks, yeah, thanks, thanks, Dan. Um, by email, Dave in uh, Portland asks uh, Zena. Um, he wants to know how you memorize your poetry. Is it is it something that you have to work on doing because it's just amazing to see you read these long poems and um, and memorize the whole thing. Um, I, I try, I don't always memorize them, but I try as much as possible uh, to, to memorize uh, poetry when I can. How do I do it? I just like literally repeat it to myself. I, uh, I, 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 repeat it in the shower, I look into the mirror and say it, and and some poems, like correcting my mother's essay, I've done that poem so many times now, it's like become the signature poem of that first book, 
So I, it's just like second nature to me now. But I try to memorize even even the new one. I just uh, repeat them. I think when you when you do get to that point of internalizing the poem and being able to recite it from uh, memory, uh, it's just much cooler than than reading it on the page. I just I just like I'm I'm not just a poet on the page, but I'm also a performer. I like I like the theater. I like to perform, so that comes from there. I think. Mm -hmm. There seems like there's a, a sense of of pride in your words that um, I think a lot of people feel a little little awkward about putting themselves on the line, um, and you really get your heart out there in a way that's. Um, just seems natural, and, and you're just so into it. Um, do you think uh, what are what are poetry readings like in Dubai? Um, are they the kind of um, you know in the U.S. you kind of imagine a boring bookstore where somebody's mumbling into a microphone, and um, you know the audience is quietly clapping. Um, but Dubai, I've noticed there's a big poetry scene there, and I know you you run a poetry reading series there, right? Um, yeah. Do you think it's yeah, how how do you think it's different from the states? Is it a little more um, lively? Well, um, I can't really compare it to the states because I've only been to the states once, and that was this literally this month. And I was at Split This Rock Poetry Festival, and they had an audience that rocked. So I can't really compare it, but I know from here, like when I first arrived to Dubai, there was almost no poetry scene except for this one collective that is run by my uh, filmmaker and poet friend Hind Shufani, she's Palestinian, it's called Poeticians and so I joined Poeticians and they sort of became my little poetry family and we met at this bar uh, every like two to three months and then two years down the line I said okay there should be, that we have to have more, let's just start, let's start one, you know and so I started Punch. It's called Punch, P-U-N-C-H, all caps. It's a group on Facebook. And we started in this little, literally this little poetry cafe here. And not, not poetry cafe, it's a cafe. I, in my head, I saw it and I thought, oh, let's turn this into poetry. So we started in this cafe here in Dubai. And um, uh, the readings would be like 30 to 40 people, but they would feel very familial. And people react to poetry here. Like people snap their fingers and they clap and they go, yay, and they laugh. So we, you know, I th it might be an Arab thing. I don't know. Like we can't shut up when, when a poet is, is reading. And then it's just, it, it sort of went boom from there. And now I hold readings at a much bigger uh, place. And the last two times I, I, I did Punch, which mixes featured readers with open mic, we had like 100 to 120 people come up, which, was, which is awesome. And uh, some of them, I would say half of them are like followers, so they follow Punch, and they are there almost every time when they can. And always there's more and more and more people coming in, and I try to be as inclusive as possible to the younger poets and I try to sort of get this balance so I don't want it to be all open mic because then that's a little bit dangerous because I don't know what's waiting for me so I try to mix it up with like I tell people that I know will be good okay come and do that poem and then I'll, I'll, I'll welcome as, as many new voices as I can and then they become part of the family as well and so these reading are yes they're very lively uh, and and the audience, yes, they they clap, they snap their fingers, they're just they're awesome, you know. And they buy books. Like whenever someone releases, they actually buy, they line up and buy books, you know. So there's that. And then after Punch, uh, there's this uh, bunch of younger. I'm old now. I'm in my 30s. Younger, uh, mid 20 people in their mid 20s who founded uh, something called the Dubai uh, Poetry Poetry Slam. All right, and 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 now that's another collective that's sort of mushrooming, and and I try to attend as much as possible, and so yeah, that's I hope that sort of summarizes my experience with with Dubai. Great, great, thanks, Dana. Um, and we have a question from Edward Dogar. Um, it's for DM. Um, he said you mentioned that uh, you felt not enough writers from the continent were writing about abuse. And he's wondering if uh, both of you poets were aware 
of writing toward a global audience, especially given the potential audience of this reading? Yeah. Um, well, um, for me, I you know, I think I kind of like really want every writer. It's kind of like the goal of most writers. I can't at least for me. Let me say me then, so I don't speak for others. To kind of like you know to get as many readers as you can, you know. So when I kind of like um, so when I write, I well, but when I write in my room, I write at first to you know, to satisfy, to kind of like to let my heart out, to satisfy, you know, my conscience and then put it out there and, you know, see wherever I would read. But right tending towards, you know, global audience, I I, I don't know, you know, it's kind of tricky, but but I wouldn't say no. I wouldn't say no to it. I mean, I I I, I sent my poems to Ratu while I was in Nigeria. I sent my poems out to a lot of, you know, journals in the United States and UK while I was in Nigeria. So definitely... Definitely, I had that in mind. I think that answers the question. I had that in mind, but not really the primary focus. Mm -hmm. Is there is there a reason you went to um, the U.S. to Boston University for uh, your writing degree? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to study with um, the faculty. I've always loved um, Robert Pinsky. I've always admired, you know, Robert Pinsky. So I I wanted to work with him, you know. So. I actually chose the school because of the faculty, you know, and then the, you know, the school has produced a lot of writers I admire from John Polairi um, to Carl Phillips, so I just felt it would be the right program for me and, you know, and everything worked out well. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. And before, before I turn it over to Zena for that question, um, just one last reminder, if you want to ask questions, this is pretty much your last call. We have a couple minutes left. Um, you can tweet to TA Poetry, or you can leave questions here. Um, so, Zaina, what about you? Um, are you aware of a global audience? Are you writing for that? Um, I would say no, uh, because um, I just I just write whatever I feel like I should be writing right now, and I think global is such a it's such a, like a like to me, the the global or the universal is in the particular, uh, and poetry is about telling stories, particular stories, and I certainly don't try um, to cater to a global audience. If anything, um, you know, like like Arabi song, like the the cha the rattle chat book, right? It's full of these like literally Arab references to Arab singers and, 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 and musicians and uh, things in Tripoli, Lebanon, uh, that are so specific to that particular town, right? If I were thinking, oh, but they might not get it, I might not, I might not write, write it, it might stifle me. So I try to, to think, no, this is what I should be writing right now, and, 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 and that's what I'm going to do. So I don't have any particular uh, audience in mind as I'm writing. That said, when I am actually performing or reading in different places, I might actually say, hmm, maybe I'll read that poem for this particular audience or this poem for this particular audience. But audiences always shock you anyway. People from like the end of the world come and say, oh my god, we've identified with this poem about your grandmother from the mountain in Lebanon, you know, do you know? So that's the beauty of poetry, is that it bridges. Despite all these particularities, it bridges. And so I try not to be. I try to do the exact opposite and write only what matters uh, to, to me, sort of. Hmm. That's great. Um, you know, one thing I love about, about Arabi song is um, all the references that I didn't understand and how often I had to run to Google to kind of, you know, I mean, it was a great, not only is it an emotionally powerful book that has so much music in it, but um, it was a great learning experience, too, um, just reading the book. Um, maybe with that in mind, because I don't see any new questions, um, for somebody who wants to read more uh, Middle Eastern or more uh, African poets, who would you guys recommend? I'll start with, with DM. Do you have any recommendations for poets to look up from the continent? Yeah, 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 yeah. They are pretty, you know, like there are so many good Af um, um, African poets right now. Some are based in the United States. There is a very popular one, Kwame Dawes, who runs Price Kuna. Um, there's Chris Bani, who is from Nigeria. And there are older poets, such as um, Wale Shoenka, who, 
won the Nobel Prize in 1986. And, you know, and there are younger, also younger poets, like, who are kind of like the generation before mine, you know, like um, Jumoke Verissimo, um, Lola Shone, you know. So it's, it's pretty wild. Like, the, you know, there are so many good poets right now. So, you know, yeah, I would recommend those ones for now. So I don't, you know, just... No, that's good. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. And Zaina, what about you? Would you have any recommendations? Um, do you mean in English or in Arabic or in any language? Um, in any language. Who, who are well, your favorite poets to read? We can, you know, if you don't speak Arabic, you can find translations, maybe. Uh, yeah. Well, in 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 terms of of Arabic, uh, those who write in Arabic and that you might find translation. It's the uh, Mahmoud Darwish. I love Adonis. I love. Um, uh, Jaudat Fakhreddin is a younger uh, poet uh, and also uh, the father of my friend and I like his work um, who else uh, Badr Shakir Sayab is Iraqi and he has the famous rain song Unshudatul Matar if you don't know it, google it it's called Rain Song and it is amazing it's about Iraq uh, from the Anglophone poets, I, I discovered Leila Shakti and Rattle, actually, and I do love what she's doing. Uh, I love her work. Uh, Phil Metris, he's Lebanese-American. Fadi Juda, uh, uh, Riwa Zinati, who's a friend of mine. Um, Hint Shufani, who's a friend of mine. Dima Shehabi did this... Uh, book called Diaspora Renga, so di from Diaspora and Renga, the form Renga, with Marilyn Hacker, and it's a, it's, a, it's a really good book, it's called Diaspora Renga, so it's a dialogue between Marilyn and Dima, Dima K. Shahabi. Lena Tufaha Khalaf is writing right now, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that I'm not forgetting, I will forget, but I'm trying to brainstorm. Dunya Mikhail uh, is, is a good Iraqi poet as well. And of course, there's the Naomi Shihab Nye. I haven't mentioned her because everyone knows her, right? She's she's awesome. I hope. I mean, I know I've forgotten some people. Forgive me if I've forgotten, but that's that's what comes to mind right now. Well, that's great. Thank you so much. And we'll put um, the names everybody mentioned in the in the notes on YouTube when the video goes up there. Um, well, I guess that's it for the show. The hours up already. Uh, thanks so much to to DM Adira Baby. Uh, Thank thanks so much to Zainab Hashimbek uh, and to Robert Peak. If you're there, uh, he hasn't popped in to say hi yet, but I think he's there. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, we can. Yeah. We can hear you, Robert. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks yeah. again for putting this together. Um, do you want to? Do you want to put the splash screen? Because my my thing for the next reading is not popping up still. Sure. So our next reading is going to be on Saturday, the 21st of May. Um, again, at this time, so 6 p.m. in the U.K., 1 p.m. on the East Coast, 10 a.m. on the West Coast of America. Um, hosted by the Poetry Society, we'll be featuring Sarah Howe, who just won the T.S. Eliot Prize, one of the biggest prizes here in the U.K. with her debut collection, and Eric Berlin, who won the National Poetry Competition this year. So it should be a terrific reading again that Saturday, May, May the 21st. Um, just want to say again, thanks so much to both readers. It was incredibly rich and and, uh, and wonderful reading. And thanks to Tim for hosting it. Yeah, thank, thank you, you. Robert. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Robert. Thank, thanks, Tim. Thanks, Robert. And thanks, Zena, for the amazing points too. All right. Yeah.